so thank you very much indeed for making time to talk to me about this. I should just say that my attention was drawn to your work because of a paper in the Indonesian um, Journal of Phenomenology, which yeah. um, was a paper the just Indo Pacific from, Journal of Phenomenology. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in particular, because with Kathy Adams, we're looking at the whole idea of what is it like as to be a student um, in a Zoom breakout room. So what is the experience of the learner in a Zoom breakout room? And so Jean's paper, Living in the Age of, an, of the Embodied Screen, uh, just seemed to really um, have resonance uh, and probably quite important messages to draw from that. In the phenomenology of practice approach, we look at, oh, the dog is going to go bonkers. <laughs> the builders have just arrived. <laughs> Sorry. At least that's, it's going to be a joyful dog, not an angry dog. So that's, that's fine. Good. Um, in phenomenology of practice, we sort of are a very pretty clear that we're not, we're not philosophers. And it's a privilege for me today to talk to, to professional philosophers really um and and so that my position with regard to philosophy is that the sort of um insight cultivators so they have important insights to bring into the study um of phenomenology as it is sort of applied as, as, a, as a practice uh, in investigating these sorts of questions what is it like to be a learner in this situation so that's what drew our attention to your work and then um, I thought, oh, I'll send a tentative email to you guys and see what happens. Um, so, so can you just say, because I've obviously I've done a little bit of working out who you guys are and what you've been mm. up to. Um, do you think you could just very briefly introduce yourselves and say, John, do you want to go first? Okay, cool. Yeah, I am uh, Jean Dupre. I'm from the Northwest University, which is obviously in South Africa. And um, yeah, I'm very interested in the relationship between embodiment, um, phenomenologically understood, and, uh, and how that relates to digital technologies. And um, Greg and I have actually been working on this topic a bit. We've published quite a, a couple of papers on kind of relating the embodied, in, uh, embedded kind of experience of encountering digital technologies and contrasting that to, you know, historically decontextualized perspectives as well, as well. And what does that imply or suggest for us as educators? Um, I've written a, um, an article on embodied digital technology and transformation in higher education and specifically how we engage with students in this rationalistic framework, but we forget to contextualize them as embodied beings that are learning. You know, and that has very specific implications for how we conduct uh, our pedagogy, both in the classroom and online as well. Um, and and uh, Greg, you can jump in as well, but we've written quite a bit on how while expanding potentials for embodiment, we also find kind of the delimitation of embodied experience and, um, mm. and the encountering of the digital. Um, and that is one of our more recent uh, papers. I don't know if you want to expand on that one, Greg, if you want, uh, when you are yeah. introducing yourself. What? <laughs> sure. Um, okay. I'm Gregory Swear. Um, I'm a senior lecturer at um, Walter Sisulu University. Uh, in the Eastern Cape uh, of South Africa. Yeah, uh, Jean and I have been, if not working together, bouncing ideas off each other since we ran into each other at a postgraduate conference way, <laughs> way back in the midst of time. Yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a shared interest in technology and it's a shared interest in phenomenological approaches that kind of drew us together in the first place. Um, Oh, sorry about that. The, uh, no, no problem. Uh, the uh, the thing was originally we kind of bounced off each other. I think because my 
inclination was towards Heidegger, whereas Jean was more towards Merleau-Ponty, who I did not care for. I think the feeling was more or less mutual. I might have unkindly referred to him as the poor man's Heidegger a couple of times, which Jean, I apologize now, but Jean was doing this work on this concept of what he called the embodied screen. Mm. And he took this idea from Merleau-Ponty, which, which I, I, I hadn't appreciated, um, which is that we need to stop viewing our existence online as something other, as some kind of transcendental mode, you know, like we've plugged ourselves into the matrix and the mind has all gone all floating somewhere, all ethereal like, and to view the digital space as another mode of embodiment. And that, that was like a light bulb moment um, uh, for, for me. And since then, that's what we've been exploring. If you do view the virtual as a mode of embodiment, what are the implications? And, and we just, again, found that the phenomenological mode of analysis uh, worked best for this. Now, recently with this lockdown uh, and this, this, everyone says switch, with this lurch to online teaching, <laughs> mm. you, you, there you are desperately trying to squeeze your phenomenological content into these learning management system parameters, yeah? And you do it because it's crisis mode, so you just do it. And then one day you kind of sit there and go, hang on, I'm teaching phenomenology in an utterly unphenomenological <laughs> way, yeah. using technology, which I'm not analyzing. <laughs> <laughs> Something's it's wrong with this out. picture. Yeah, so that's that's the that's the way we're we're kind of working at, at the moment. You know, just what's it like to be in this in in this mm -hmm. <laughs> crisis mode embodied environment in these strange strange learning management systems? And I don't don't not knock in the system, you know, because you know that that we have they have proved very useful, but uh, we just feel that the the experiences. Um, of both the, the the teachers and and the taught, hopefully the taught, um, uh, require um, thorough uh, uh, analysis yeah. um, because otherwise you find yourself. And we talk about how can we improve our teaching practice using the LMSs. You're talking in this kind of uber rationalist mode, yeah. you know, which should be should have the effect of like sprinkling salt on slugs to phenomenologists. But don't we engage in it because it's management talk, you know? <laughs> but this cognitive dissonance. Yeah, sorry, I witter. Mm. Ah, no, but, but it's it, once the learning management systems have got their legs under the table sort of thing, um, then you are faced with a situation where something else um, is almost unthinkable. And so mm -hmm. you are left with these impoverished situations. Um, and it's no wonder then if you get accounts of students feeling alienated, uh, particularly if they've never met each other before um, mm. in, in the flesh to use the word um but yeah i was fascinated by the embedded embodied screen thing and i, I noticed you'd also um written the manifesto uh, oh yeah oh yeah and i did <laughs> quite a fun paper to write just to kind of sketch our approach in terms of the the general movement in uh, philosophy of technology um so that was quite fun and, and we did, didn't uh go much into the phenomenological side of that, but we did criticize some of the mainstreams uh, of contemporary philosophy of technology. Um, you know, one of the problems with um, not taking a, a phenomenological approach, you know, phenomenology as practice, is that you leave behind so much of the intersectionality of the students, right? Because it, they become these decontextualized um, online entities and and that's highly problematic so we're incorporating some critical theory into this as well so it's coming from the philosophy of technology perspective which we did in the manifesto and the phenomenology side as well and some critical theory uh, thrown in at times for good measure <laughs> when we want to engage and then give it a good good stir yeah yeah, yeah well the uh, certainly critical theory uh, is a happy time in the network learning conference um mm. and but so does something like actor network theory uh, which ends up strangely to me um, almost running in the opposite direction to phenomenology in terms of you know this sort of leveling out um of everything having mm. agency um whereas um I, I know it could be turned on its head and say well you know it does emphasize the, the human as well but um actually uh i don't think it does that in 
Uh, I th basically, I'm running out of steam here. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I just find that I, I just don't feel com particularly comfortable with that. Um, yeah, we, we don't apply actual network theory much in our work. I think Latour also kind of moved on a bit from that. Um, but there well, seems to... Go on. No, please. Oh, I was just going to say that there seems to be a, a bit of a moment going on in network learning, uh, probably not a field that you're familiar with, um, but uh, where there seems to be this space uh, that some people who are interested in phenomenology have have taken encouragement from our kind of very naive move into the the space and 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 so we try to coalesce a bit of strength around that and one of our purposes is to try and full, um, encourage that uh, in the conference so you know maybe there'll be another voice apart from um, the actor network theory stuff at the next conference and we hope to uh, get work up a symposium um, as well. Now, a lot of a lot of the papers in that might be at the level of what I was just talking about with phenomenology of practice, um, but there are one or two people as well who come at things from a more um, purely philosophical perspective, um, and and you know maybe you'd be willing to make a contribution there as well. Um, but what were you going to say, yeah. Greg? Oh no! So it was just off, off on a, off on a slight tangent. Um, one thing, okay. There, there's the state of play um, in the philosophy of technology, which, which is the area that should be particularly concerned with this kind of network learning. You know, as, as one of its, its areas. But it seems to have moved into this kind of social constructivist, post phenomenologist space, um, which Jean and I don't find particularly conducive. Um, so one of the things we were trying to do with the manifesto and stuff is we're saying, look. Even though it sounds paradoxical, an awful lot of work that was done in what they now call classic philosophy of technology, yeah, um, so 30s, 40s stuff, uh, Lewis Mumford, Jacques Ellul, people like that, people who were not specialist philosophers but kind of straddled a variety of disciplines and brought a, a bunch of insights together, had a handle on a lot of what network society looks like back in the 30s. Now, they got kind of abandoned because they were viewed as being reductionist or determinist or just too gloomy or talking about old technology because we like the whizzy new shiny technologies, right? Mm. So if you actually go back to them and read about the kind of the existential analysis they were saying, here's what it like feels like being a cog in this networked rationalist system. It fits perfectly. So one of the things we've been trying to do is, is to keep a kind of practical technological angle, but, but drawing upon the resources of this neglected field uh, of, of research uh, and trying to bring that into conversation with, with phenomenology. I mean, that's, that's one of the, the kind of <laughs> the core commitments insofar as we have core commitments. John. Absolutely. <laughs> Not, yeah, not fully been uh, formulated yet, but yeah, if we have commitments, it would include those, yeah. <laughs> so it's, it's an ongoing project. We have, we're working on some uh, research related to networked alienation as well, early days, but kind of expanding this, in, uh, especially in terms of the delimitation of the embodiment and the embodied experience in this context. So... That's kind of the trajectory we are heading towards. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I mean, we think, I think in network learning, um, we're doing well if we've correctly diagnosed stronger or weaker forms of technological determinism. You know, it's it's an interesting field in as much as, uh, yes, it's cross-disciplinary, interdisciplinary, um, but some people might be coming at it for the first time, let's say at the conference next time, undoubtedly there'll be newbies who have woken up and found, oh, technology is interesting in <laughs> when we try and do things with students with it. And, you know, it's just, and they probably have never read anything, let alone someone like me who's re read a little bit and realized how little I have actually read, um, <laughs> even though I've been in the field for like 20 years. So, um, you know, I just, uh, I just feel like I'm completely out of my depth yeah, talking it, to you guys it would be interesting to also package this a bit um, for uh, as you say newbies and students as well we were talking about that before Greg entered entered the room as well to um, kind of get it to, um, to communicate to their experience because mm. there's a very practical side to what we're 
we're saying as well. So I think it's accessible yeah. to mm. students and to students and so on. Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, this this the kind of research that you're talking about uh, is is exactly the kind of 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 real world study that that anyone uh, trying to do a proper phenomenological analysis uh, of online existence needs to be getting to grips with. I mean, it's yeah. it's fundamental. Yeah. I mean, again, for us, it's the beauty of phenomenology is it's not purely theoretical. Um, although we do love our theory, don't get me wrong, we love our theory, but but <laughs> it also has practical applications. Um, I mean, we again with this um, the online pivot is is we have hurled all these students online, and I mean particularly in South Africa uh, where we are, a lot of these students have never had a laptop before. Sure. Um, so this this is their, their kind of um, brutal introduction to to online existence and there's no preparation there's no safety net. no one's no one's considering what this must be like to go from state school you know often in rural areas and suddenly whap there you are you're at university but through a laptop and and you're expected to have basic competency and all of these things all of these factors i mean <laughs> what what impact is that going to have on the educational experience i don't mean that in a kind of trivial qualitative fashion but i mean what's it like to be a student what's it like to learn like this under these circumstances with these means now, i don't think that's that's a trivial question uh, these are core questions for network learning for sure mm. And it's in as much as the core questions for any other part of, let's say, the applied educational research world, um, I think network learning has that critical angle, has always had it. Um, so, you know, it has some pedigree with this, um, going back since the first conference in 1998. So, um, you know, it's been going for a while. Um, and it's good that it runs biannually because that means that people have something to do you know, and then actually produce, you know, a little bit of time to produce something um, between the years. Um, the deadline's October, so we need to go, those of us that are submitting have to pull our socks up a bit. But um, I think um, probably we've got 10 minutes up here, and I think some of the things that you've been saying have been absolutely fantastic for um, us to dwell upon and and consider and, um, in our paper about zoom breakout rooms but also in general and i'm very wary of taking more of your time now so i'm sort of closing off a little bit and i'll probably stop recording soon so um at least um we'll be off the hook with that is that okay that's that's fine yeah, that's okay, okay. <laughs> I was just going to ask one kind of question at the end, unless you had something else to say. No, you can go first. Yeah. All right. So um, given what I've said about the naivety that, that exists in the field um, or the difficulty of, of entering it really properly um, philosophically, um, what are the kind of rocks to avoid? I've mentioned already um, technological determinism and its various sort of shades. Um, but what do you think um, people should watch out for um, as they're thinking about learning technology? Uh, hmm. I think I, I think one of the things in terms of perhaps phenomenology in relation to technology is that especially for people just starting out there's this this barrier and that is that there are these canonical works in philosophy and canonical mm. thinkers and that that some sometimes gets disconnected from practicing phenomenology you know mm. doing phenomenology instead of uh, linking to the canon and of course there's value in that for professional philosophers or uh, budding professional philosophers as well but I think that's sometimes a barrier of entry to some of our students in terms of the phenomenology of technology is they get caught up on the canon and not uh, and don't get to the point where they start doing the phenomenology. Mm. I think that's one of the, in terms of the phenomenology of uh, technology at least. Um, Greg, did you want to? Uh, no, I, I think I think that's 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 definitely definitely an issue. I mean, I remember reading somewhere that uh, one of the kind of the the, the patron saints uh, of of uh, phenomenology of technology, I and mean, um, 
uh, in in his lectures used to I'm thinking you know, taking some practices. He used to actually get the students to do practical exercises with technology of some sort. And I've, I've always envied that. I thought that that would be the way, that would be the trick, because the trick is not to get hung up on the canon exactly as Jean said, it's to get the gist and then do something with it. Yeah, mm. get the spirit and do it. Because once you start doing that, then you'll find yourself evolving the phenomenology you've got. You'll find yourself needing bits and not needing certain bits, and you'll look for the phenomenologist who can give it to you. And then you kind of bolt together a, a toolkit, uh, depending on what your needs are, depending on what you're looking at. And and it's it's organic. Um, yeah, so that's what I'd say. Yeah, that's a wonderful answer, both of you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's very encouraging as well, because it does give you permission, as it were, to tread in waters which are full of rocks, actually, um, and difficult ob just obstacles. Um, so did you, did you want to say anything before I kind of cut the camera? As it were, yeah, it's it's fine for me. Um, yeah, we covered the main thing. <laughs> no, just th thanks, thanks for having us. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I really appreciate this. <laughs> All right, I'll stop recording. Thank you so mm -hmm. much. Uh...